Hall. Alder Dorf. Here. Alder Corpus Dax. Present. <clears throat> Alder Johnson. Here. Okay, I'll entertain a motion on the agenda. No proof. Second. Any changes anyone wants to make to it? <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, I'll entertain a motion on the minutes. Move to approve. Second. Second. Second, I have a motion to approve by Alder Dorf, second by Hare, by Alder Johnson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Aye, that passes unanimously. On the regular business, item number one, consideration with possible action on the request to fill the following replacement positions and all subsequent vacancies resulting from internal transfers. Public Works Supervisor for the Public Works Department and a Deputy City Clerk's Office. Do any alders have any questions for staff on this? Alder Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I just have a question um, regarding the Deputy City Clerk. Two questions, actually. Uh, one is I saw this edition published uh, probably last week already, and it, it just took me by surprise that it would be published before we've actually authorized the replacement. Is that a normal process just to expedite or yeah, Elder Johnson. So in our policies, yep, in our policies, the director of HR has the discretion to start posting and recruiting before it's approved by personnel in the Common Council. But we will not fill that position unless we have approval from the Common Council. Okay, thank you. And, and it was more so I just wanted to be educated on that process. Uh, the second question I have uh, is is maybe even more of a, a concern for the department in that obviously the. As far as I know, the uh, department head is still out on leave. Are there concerns in terms of how we're going to fill that responsibility um, once uh, the deputy clerk vacates? Yeah, at this point, I mean, obviously we're short staffed in the short staffed in the clerk's office. So we're working as soon as we can to make sure that both or all of those responsibilities are filled. So we want to have a I guess the deputy clerk position and the city clerk position responsibilities filled as soon as we can. So, I mean, are there concerns? We have the election coming up, I believe, in February, and um, the deputy clerk, Kim Wade, has done a great job of getting a lot of that put together. I think a lot of that's due this week. So, yeah, we're doing everything we can and trying to help out as much as we can from other departments to give the city clerk as much assistance as we can. Okay, I just, and I appreciate that update because obviously that's kind of what was crossing my mind is with the next election coming up, ongoing responsibilities, you're down your, your top two positions. Um, happy to hear that you guys are, are working on a plan there. Okay, any other questions by uh, uh, alders for staff? I'll entertain a motion then. Move to approve. Second. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alderdorf, I believe you had your hand raised before. I, I did, but the second question Alder Johnson asked was my exactly my question. Okay. So I didn't right. need okay. to ask it again. All right, so I have a motion to approve and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Item number two, a request by Alder Johnson to the Personnel Committee for an update on the Alder Person Orientation Program that was submitted approximately two years ago. Alder Johnson, do you want me to start or do you want to start on this? Yeah, I'm just looking for an update, so go ahead, Joe. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, the request did come in about two years ago, and, you know, I apologize for that, get that not being done earlier. So the update is we have been working on it. We have about 60 to 70 pages of a document put together. Um, a lot of it is probably what you've already seen with, um, you know, our ethics code, our, um, with uh, the statutory requirements of the elected officials, and then also some documents about civic clerk and other items like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send that out to the Common Council tomorrow. And what I'd like to see is if the Common Council could go through it and review it and, and kind of give us some feedback on what they think about it, you know, what we should add to it. And then some things we do have to add is we'd like to have some contact information and a description of each department included as well. So I will include the HR document that goes through that and then I'll be asking for other departments to include that as well. So I thought is you guys can look at the documents, review it, let, let us know what we can do to improve on that. And then in early February when our city attorney does return, if we could have that orientation virtually with everyone. And how I anticipate that would go would be um, Director Ronick um, would like to go over some 
IT, I guess, um, information. I think it might have been a request for service and, and some civic clerk um, programs as well. And then I think uh, Alder Dorf asked about if we could give an update on uh, social media use for elected officials. And then we also were going to, I guess, just answer any questions that you had that you could submit before uh, the virtual meeting or at the meeting. So what I'm hoping for is that we can have a pretty good run through in um, February and we can get some good feedback on how it works and what we can do to improve and then be all set for 2022 with the new Common Council. <laughs> so hopefully we should be set by then. Okay, and the reason I, I, I brought this up is, is it, partially because of some, you know, the, the complaint that was brought before the ethics committee. And I, you know, I looked at that and thought, gosh, boy, all of council would probably benefit from, you know, having a better understanding of what the social media rules are. Um, it, you know, but it's, it's one of those things where it, to draw the closest parallel, every nonprofit organization, at least well-established ones, put their new board members through an orientation. So if I could offer up maybe a bit of advice, Director Falls, is a simple Google search, common things included in the orientation packet. I will obviously take a look at um, what you guys put together and make recommendations of things that can be added. Um, as someone who, who manages a nonprofit, you know, I put all of my new, my new boards through that. Um, I think it's a really important step that the city is missing right now that um, would allow our alders to be more effective and, and make more informed decisions, which I think not only serves the citizens of Green Bay, but obviously helps with staff as well. And, um, and just feedback for what it's worth, I think several of us had joined in on the, um, the, the session with SIPNIC. And while I think it was well-intentioned, I don't know that it hit the mark in terms of uh, what we are trying to achieve there. So just, again, feedback for what it's worth there. I don't know that I would include that in this orientation program, but um, I would defer to other alders that sat in on that to, to I guess, tell you directly if they found value in that session. No, thank you for that feedback. And, you know, I'll reach out to CIMIC as well. You know, I think our intent from there was to get more of a um, – I guess training from CIVMIC on what the pitfalls and liability can be being an elected official. And I'm not sure if that was exactly hit upon. You know, I think there were some things they did well and some things that we can improve upon. And then obviously with uh, orientation, our goal is to tailor it specifically to the common council of the city of Green Bay. That's what we're trying to do. And I think that was a lot of the feedback that we got from alders is, you know, what can we do? What can we have to have contact information for specific departments? Who do we go to on specific issues? So that's where we're trying to really tailor it to the city of Green Bay and not just have a general orientation program. So that's what we're trying to do. And any feedback would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay, a motion. Uh, well, maybe one, one question, Dr. Falls. You said you anticipate sending this out before the next meeting. I will send it out tomorrow, what we have. <laughs> okay, so so in, in which case, I would move that uh, we just hold this because I would like for us to have the ability to discuss it and keep that project moving forward at the next meeting. Yep, that sounds good to me. Is that a motion? Yes. Yes. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Item number three, request for consideration and approval to award a three-year contract for Crossing Guard Services RFP number 3262 to Cross Safe Everything Parking, Inc. for the estimated amount of $1,338,656 with two one-year renewals upon mutual agreement due to the cancellation of the original contract with All City Management Services, Inc. Staff. So we do have um, HR Operations Manager Melanie Falk that can talk to this and also Commander Work. So I'm not sure if you want to start, Melanie, or Kevin, or Commander Work, do you want to start us, start us off, please? Absolutely. Um, when, when we brought this in front of the Personnel Committee uh, a couple weeks ago, and we in the committee had approved us awarding the contract to All Cities Management Services, um, that did take place. Uh, all City Management Services did accept that contract. Uh, but then came to us with the concerns after they signed the contract that they could not abide by that contract. Um, in essence, um, Kelvin and purchasing um, did a great job with an RFP, uh, put out the RFP. We received four vendors or four people wanting to, for that bid, 
for vendors for that bid. Uh, in turn, we did award it to all cities management services, but then they came back after signing and saying that they could not do that because uh, unbeknownst to myself and others that the city of Green Bay were paying crossing guards uh, time when they were not working. Meaning in, in, the, in, the, in the city on a given day, we would employ a hundred hours. And I'll, I'll let Kelvin explain this in greater detail, uh, but all cities management, we, we told all cities management to say that it takes a hundred hours per day to staff the crossing guard program. In turn, the city of Green Bay has been paying 130 hours. All cities management services wanted to raise their prices to reflect 130 hours uh, because they felt that they didn't want to be, uh, they didn't want crossing guards to feel the effect financially. Um, we did not know that we were paying crossing guards not to work. Um, and this is probably dates back prior to Act 10 and prior to when the crossing guards were covered under the AFSCME union um, that they were getting paid hours that they were not working for. So they wanted to raise their price. We did not agree to that price. We could not, we could not do that um, uh, per purchasing. Uh, so we allowed them to back out of that contract and we went to the third vendor um, who is slightly more expensive, still a cost savings to the city. Uh, and we are bringing that forth to the committee uh, for, for approval. Mm -hmm. um, I'll turn it over to Melanie Falk if I missed anything or Kelvin to really describe the, the financial aspect of this um, and, and how this all played out. Yeah, Kelvin. So I, I will talk to um, how we went about reawarding um, this once all city management said that they could not uh, provide these services. Um, you know, we, we did negotiate back and forth with them, um, had several meetings to discuss um, what, what could be done. And ultimately they did decide that um, they would not be able to offer that unless we were able to increase the price that we were going to pay them. Um, so we elected that we would move on from them. Um, st uh, the standard procedure for this is we would go to the next um, highest scoring proposer, um, which was Andy Frain. Um, we all brought forward the same information to them, um, you know, that we brought to all city management that they were, uh, the crossing guards were being paid, um, you know, for hours beyond what they were working. Uh, Andy Frayne also indicated that they in turn would then need to raise their um, quoted rate as well. So uh, at that point, we did go down to the third uh, highest scoring proposer, presented them with the same information. Uh, they indicated that they would hold their pricing. Uh, they actually did just go through a very similar situation um, with another municipality where uh, crossing guards are being paid more. Um, and so they did indicate that there were some struggles with, you know, retention and turnover, um, but ultimately they worked through that. Um, they have requested that obviously the city assist them in getting through what may be an initial, an initial painful um, start to it, just because, you know, it, it is a change, um, you know, and not only is it a change to the amount of hours they're being paid for, but, you know, there's no um, state retirement system anymore that goes with it. So um, these are gonna be, employees of the vendor, they're no longer employees of the city. Um, but uh, Altsafe did say that they were um, going to honor what they submitted um, and that, uh, so that's why we went to the third one. So now we're seeking approval, um, bringing it back. And then ultimately we would sign a new contract with all city management, or uh, I'm sorry, with CrossSafe and the contract with all city management will be voided out. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments or concerns? Uh, Alder Johnson. Thank you. If you could just refresh my memory, Calvin, what was the original contract? What amount was that for? Um, I don't have that in front of me. I don't know, Melanie, do yes. you have that yes, in front of you? Um, we did provide all of the, um, in your packet, you did get all of the, the bid summary and that did show the total cost um, for the full five year or the three year contract. Um, I've got so that. We, it's yeah. on page three. It's on page yeah. three. Yes. In the so that shows all of that shows all of the costs that were submitted with all of the RFPs. Right. Uh, my page three is blank. Um, it's one million three hundred and fourteen thousand six hundred seventy-two. Was that was that one one three one four? And this one is one three three eight. Correct. Yeah, so, and if we look at what all city management wanted to increase their rates to, um, we are actually, we are gonna be saving money still. I mean, as Commander Work said, we are still 
going to have a savings to the city as well. Okay, and, and I did find the chart. Uh, my apologies, I missed that initially. Um, and that's ultimately why I was asking what the difference was because, and you just answered it, Kelvin. I just wanted to reaffirm that this was still going to result in the, you know, the savings that we were looking for. Yeah, there still will be a net savings to the city. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alder Corpus Dax. Um, I think it's, you know, great. Obviously that we're saving money. Um, I do have some concerns. I'm guessing I um, would like to know if you guys have concerns that they scored almost half in some cases um, compared to all city management. So I mean, is it the references? <laughs> yeah, uh, this is, is staff concerned with that at all. It, this is Melanie Falk, uh, human resources so manager. Number, I think like um, tab two overall firm qualifications where the highest score was 20, um, cross safe was 12, and then the training programs where cross safe, or, uh, city management was 20, cross safe was 11. Um, yeah, Alder Corpus Dex, um, HR manager Falk can answer that. I think you might be yes, muted. Yes, can you? Can you hear me? Yes. You can, okay. Um, with respect to the lower ratings, the- No, I can't. We... Oh. No, no, not anymore. <laughs> yeah, Melanie, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that, I'm over at the podium now. This mic seems <laughs> to be working. Uh, with respect to the lower score, uh, references played a key in this. Um, Cross safes references they they did not have any Wisconsin contracts as opposed to ACMS that had a number of state municipalities that they had contracted with um, so that was an area in which we scored them a little bit lower um, than ACMS and then second to that um, ACMS provided a very comprehensive training program um, it was very well laid out. Cross safes was a little bit more generic, and as a result of that, um, they were scored a little bit lower in that area. Um, I do want to note, though, that uh, Cross Safe has been providing crossing guard services for 11 years. Um, again, that's that's less years than our first vendor, which I believe had 20 some, 25 years of experience with crossing guards, but they do have 11 years of service. The references that we did receive um, were exemplary. Um, these municipalities and school districts are happy with the service that they're being provided. Okay, thank you. Alder Johnson. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to be sure that I fully understand what's really happening here. So, so essentially, um, what we have are, are under the current arrangement where these individuals work for the police department, they're just being paid for hours that they're not working because that was part of a an long-standing agreement. Um, the new contractor would not do that. So the fear that the new contractor has is that they will have higher turnover, which will force additional work to recruit new people. Is, is that kind of at the heart of what's happening here? Correct. Yes, that, would, that is really why, that was the big reason for um, the change from the original selected vendor to this new vendor. The new vendor has indicated they have gone through this before. Um, and so they, they know how to handle this. Um, you know, and I think you're gonna, you would see turnover with no matter which vendor it was gonna be to, um, cause you're going from city employment to, you know, private employment. So you were gonna see turnover regardless. Um, the reduction of hours I'm, I'm assuming is going to affect that more, but um, Cross Safe has indicated that they have been dealing with this. Um, they've obviously, they've requested some assistance from the city um, in, you know, maybe some advertising or something like that, but ultimately it will be Cross Safe's uh, responsibility to recruit and hire and train those individuals. Has, has have, have any of those firms indicated what level of turnover we should anticipate? And, and does that turnover present any concerns for the police department? Cross I, yeah, I do not know if they did or not. Melanie, I don't know if you can yeah, speak to that at all. Yeah, cross safe. Um, had informed the, the lead buyer on this project that they saw about a 30% turnover in a municipality that did the same thing. 
and from the police department, you know, we're committed to make sure that every corner is staffed. Um, and we understand that 2020 and 2021 is, is kind of the, um, you know, anomaly given, given COVID. Um, so we're committed to making sure that those, those intersections are staffed. Um, and we'll, Melanie Skolmoski's on our, on our, on the, on a call here. We will ensure, and we will work with them for the 2021 school year till June to ensure that those intersections are staffed. Okay, and I appreciate that that affirmation. I mean, normally if we're just looking at, you know, hey, we're going to go to the next bidder. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, but in this particular instance, obviously the it, it, it's a pretty big shift in terms of how we're compensating people. So I just want to make sure that you know we go to the next you know, the next uh, rated individual, the next bidder, number three in this case, uh, but the terms are still different. So I just wanna make sure that the police department's comfortable with the change of the terms and that, you know, and that we're not gonna have a hole there that we're unable to fill. Yeah, and I, I echo your same concerns. Um, we, we do feel that this is the right direction. Um, we, we do feel that in the, it's, is in the best interest of the city for this, um, to pursue this vendor, um, not only because it's gonna, um, free up a lot of staff time, but over three years, according to purchasing, it's going to be about a $61,000 savings. I also felt some personal accountability because when I came before you a couple of weeks ago to talk about this very same topic, I said it was going to, with ACMS, it was going to be about an $86,000 savings over three years. Um, and obviously that didn't come to tuition. So um, I wanted to be in, in Melanie and our team here that has been working on this for many days, um, what felt it was in our best interest to come before you um, to make sure that they're open and transparent throughout this whole process. Kevin, um, my concern is uh, with uh, the, the whole pandemic, um, are we keeping tabs on any of our old employees? Um, are they still able to work, willing to work, uh, around to work? And uh, when this company takes over, how soon till they find out if these people are willing to come back? Uh, you know, I mean, are we gonna potentially see police officers standing up, uh, say the schools were to go back into session uh, for the next semester in January? Uh, would we potentially be seeing officers standing on corners uh, directing traffic until, you know, this company can get everything up to speed? Well, uh, yes, it is a possibility. Um, we have an obligation to make sure that those kids are safe and we will do that. Um, Melanie Skolmoski um, has been in contact with all the current crossing guards. Um, we're currently nine crossing guards short um, right now. Um, and that that is a little high going into, you know, given the fact that it is December, um, but we're always going into the school year numbers in, down in favor. Sure. Um, so. Cr to, to follow up to your question though, uh, Melanie has been contacting and have, has frequent contact with the crossing guards. And I told her to put a, you know, hold off on that um, because of the change of, of vendors here from ACMS and then coming back in front of you. Um, but it is our plan and Melanie, I had talked about this previously that whatever the decisions made um, that Melanie will make personal phone calls to all the crossing guards to explain what's going on um, you know, there is a human aspect to this that we're very conscious of to make sure we're taking care of these people. Um, though we're, we're, we're changing gears and, and giving and having them employed by a vendor, um, we're conscious of the fact that um, we need to take care of them, we need to inform them, and, you know, whatever decision is here tonight, um, we will be in contact with them. All right, thank you. Are there any, uh, Alder Dorf? Is, are, are they currently working? Right now, well, no, no, they're not. There, there is a few. I, Melanie yeah. Skolmoski, I, I believe there's only one or two crossing guards that are currently working um, during this pandemic. So, are we saving money on that this year? Yeah, we're saving about. I mean, if, if if we have no crossing guards for this entire school year, the city of Green Bay is probably saving approximately four hundred seventy-one thousand. Correct, Commander. We have two working due to their proximity to parochial schools that are in session. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? Staff want to follow up with any other comments? I'll entertain a motion. To approve. Wait. Are we in? Okay, yes, second. A second. Okay. I thought we were closed session for a oh, minute. I thought we were okay. closed session. No, nope, yep. not there yet. Not there all right, yet. so uh, a motion to approve and a second. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. That passes unanimously. On to uh, item number four, update and discussion on bus mechanic labor negotiations. Um, do any count, uh, committee members feel the need or does staff feel the need to go into closed session? Yeah, we feel like we should go into closed session. All right. Move to go into um, closed session. All right, I have a motion to go into closed session. Second. I have a second. Brian, can you read the verbiage? Uh, the committee may convene in closed session pursuant to section 19.85, subsection 1, subsection E, Wisconsin statutes. For purposes of deliberating or negotiating public employee contracts for competitive or bargaining reasons, the committee may thereafter reconvene in open session pursuant to section 19.85, subsection 2, Wisconsin statutes to report the results of the closed session and consider the balance of the agenda. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 And we are in closed session. And we're back in session after discussing an update on the bus mechanic labor negotiations for which I will entertain a motion. I move that um, staff proceed as directed in closed session. Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And that passes unanimously. On to item five. Consideration with possible action to repeal and replace Personnel Policy Chapter 23.2, Families First Coronavirus Response Act with Chapter 23.2, COVID-19 Paid Sick Leave, effective January 1st, 2021. Staff. So I included in the, the packet the memo and then also the new policy and then the policy that would be repealed um, if this policy was approved. So really what prompted this is that the federal law is going to expire December 31st. Um, of this year and what that law allows for right now is they it's two weeks of paid sick leave due to covid related leave and then 12 weeks of leave for child care um, due to a school closing or child care closing so um and then also the the police and fire had a similar benefit that the city created um, that expired on november 6th so uh, i included in the memo the cost and just salary dollars didn't include fringe benefits um, for the city for the 2020 so with this um, leave that's expiring at the end of the month, we're recommending that a COVID-19 paid sick leave be put in place that go through April 2021. So this is 40 hours of paid sick leave for someone who is advised to quarantine due to COVID-19 or is experiencing symptoms and is seeking a medical diagnosis. So um, employees who are able to remote work would not be eligible for this leave, um, just like the federal law, unless they're unable to physically work due to COVID. Um, and then, this new leave does not provide options for leave for caring for a child due to childcare or school closing. Um, and then any amount of leave that was used for COVID, whether that's COVID um, being diagnosed or quarantined for close contact or for childcare leave, any amount of hours would then count towards the 2021. So essentially, if you've used 40 or more hours, you're not eligible. If you've used less than 40 hours, you can use up to 40 hours. And like I put in the memo, we do not have any funding for this benefit. Uh, this would come out of the salary, salary line item for each position. Um, and uh, the potential cost could come from employees who are um, eligible for an escrow when they retire. They will not have to dip into their own sick leave account so they could save that for their escrow when they retire. So I have talked to both the transit unions, fire unions and police unions, and uh, they're all agreeable to this proposal. Uh, this benefit can be repealed, amended or extended at any time with the common council approval. Um, and then if there's a different law that is passed by the federal government that extends the current law or maybe has some different type of law that's passed, um, the Common Council could then um, repeal this um, policy and could have it coincide with the new law that goes through. So that's kind of an overview if you guys have any questions on the policy. Uh, Alder Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Director Faults, and perhaps if, if anyone from PD wants to chime in since you're on the line, um, the, the one thing that kind of crossed my mind on this is that uh, this still doesn't kick in to effect until January 1st, which means our police and fire are still, still remain exposed, uh, meaning that they have no benefit or no coverage on this. That's right. Um, I, I'd like to get maybe a reaction or some feedback on um, having this take effect January 1st, with the exception of police and fire, um, where it would take effect immediately upon uh, council adoption. Looking for feedback. I guess the, the first thing I'll jump in and then uh, Commander Warwick or Chief Smith can, um, I'll just say that you know at this point, just like for our regular employees, um, there is no funding for it. So if 
the Common Council would like to do that. Um, I don't think there would be any objections from police and fire. I would need to go back to them and ask if they would be covered. And at this point, the transit uh, union is covered, so we would not need to go to them uh, to see if they'd be covered for that. Just want to be clear on that. So I'm not sure if Chief Smith or Commander Warwick want to chime in. Chief, I'll, I'll go after you. <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, obviously, we'd like to keep making sure our people are, are covered. What we've been able to do, though, is the people that have been getting COVID or being having to stay from quarantine, we made arrangements for them to be able to work from home. So there's almost no occasions where people lost money right now. Even though we ended the prior procedure in November, people aren't losing money because we're finding stuff for them to do at home. Um, and I don't know, Kevin can maybe give us an update on today on how many people are out with COVID, but it's a very low number. Yeah, we have one employee that's out um, and he's out because his uh, family member tested positive. So we're keeping him out. So he you know, gives him a couple days to get him into his days off um, to uh, make sure he doesn't bring that virus in. But um, to echo the chief's thought, uh, what the chief's comment is, we've provided meaningful work for police officers to do at home. Um, a lot of a lot of administrative work that we can give them a computer and that they can do. Um, so we have gone great at great lengths to do um, to do that because there was a lot of um, 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 heartburn, for the lack of better words, um, after November six when that benefit ended for police and fire. But we had a pretty good successful uh, turnaround our own um, of taking care of our employees standing up for them and um, you know if, if this pandemic continues to go on the way it is at current time you know if, if you if the council chooses to do that uh, I'm sure police officers would be very much appreciative of that but please note that if people you know we've I bet you of the 237 employees in, in the police department I would say a good you know a good portion maybe half um, and this is just a guess that probably have used some of that benefit in 2020 um, where this 40 hours of time would not be available to them. Um, that, you know, again, it's, it's an unfunded thing, like Joe said, um, but if, you know, if we do that for police and fire, I, they would be appreciative of that. Um, if we extended that 40 hours to everybody, they would be appreciative of that. Um, again, I, I know that there's a financial cost to that, um, but it, it would be something that is well received from our end. So Director Faults, I mean, one of the things that you talked about is that this comes under the budgeted salary category um, and that it's not necessarily an additional expense. Could you just walk us through that a little bit? So when I'm looking for, hypothetically, let's say council were to adopt this effect of the 15th, we'd basically be roughly two weeks, two weeks and a few days uh, of coverage for police and fire, recognizing that the numbers are low. Um, I mean, the financial burden of that wouldn't be very substantial, would it? So from the, the police department and the fire department and those two bargaining units, those are two that are allowed to um, retire with a sick escrow um, and they can then use the, those funds to um, go into their escrow for premiums for health insurance. So I know we had a discussion at budget about you know that fund and how it's, you know, I think it is unfunded if Diana can correct me on that, or Director Ellenbecker. So that would be one of the bargaining groups where um, there's not an immediate cost to that financially, but there can be a direct cost to that when someone retires. And then I think it's always the, the loss of time for services. Um, and I know that whether we have this benefit or not, I know that Commander Warwick and Chief Smith will do their best to make meaningful work for individuals so they can get work done and they don't have to dip into this benefit anyway. So I'm not sure if Director Ellen Becker wants to chime in on, on that. No. The one thing I'd like to add though, um, though the numbers are low today, doesn't mean the numbers are gonna be low tomorrow. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had five employees go out in one day. Um, and that, that could be catastrophic pending if, if, if it's just one shift. Now, luckily it was kind of spread out um, throughout the whole department. So staffing was not a big impact, but um, I don't wanna give the impression that just cause we're low now doesn't mean we need to act because the numbers are low. And I appreciate that. There's always obviously that level of risk. And, and I think my concern still goes to maybe the arbitrary nature of January 1. Um, I mean, January 1 obviously being in alignment with the budget here, I get that. But the, the broader concept here is if we're willing to extend a little bit of financial uh, risk and exposure um, to protect our staff after January 1st, um, I would also like to see us do that 
for the balance of the year while we have the the authority to do that and so you know i don't want to jump the gun here in case there are other alders that wish to speak on this item but i would offer up a motion to approve this with the modification that immediately for police and fire as soon as council were to adopt it yeah and i guess from my perspective too is that if you're if we're looking at this to have you know what we think would be a minimal impact and not as big as an impact as what we had in 2020 you're really just extending it two weeks you know and it's something that the police and fire department do not have so i understand what you're saying elder johnson all right um do i have a second um i could second it second it i have a question though okay uh we have a second and go ahead elder dorf so this has not been in effect since november right so for the police and fire um so i guess let me back up with um the ffcra that was mandatory for all regular employees to have the leave that i described for police and fire they were exempted from that federal law and then the common council in the city created that extra benefit for them that was slightly different than what regular employees had that expired on november 6th the thought process was well it's expiring on december 31st for all employees i mean we don't know if the federal government's going to step in we're not sure what's going to happen we don't know if we're going to extend a benefit for all employees so let's kind of let it play out and, and go from there so what my question is we started up on the 15th so it it's good for the people the 15th to the end of the month of December, but then what about from the 6th of Mar or November to the 14th of December? Um, is that, that's just the only uncovered period then? I, I'm just, it's like no good deed goes unpunished. And are, is, are there gonna be repercussions or people going, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was out, you know, during this time, how come, I'm, you know, I, can I get it too? So, do we have? Do we know? Do we have numbers? Um, or have you found meaningful work? I, I also heard Director Fault say you've been finding meaningful work, and they haven't lost money, and they haven't had to use their sick leave. So, I, I think uh, the second part of that would be the fire department, and I'm not aware of them finding a lot of um, work from home for their firefighters. And I have not looked at, and I could be wrong. Maybe they have but I have not looked at the numbers to see how many people have been out um, for police and fire between November 6th and now. Um, and those are probably numbers we can get for you. And I, I just reiterate, and uh, is that it's not funded, you know, just like it is for regular employees, it's not. So if you go back, you would have to just retroactively um, use our city funds to pay for that time off. Which we don't have, right? So no, I don't wanna change the motion. I, I'm just throwing that out as a thought of something that might come up, but I, I will just stay seconding the motion the way it was. From the police department, we've had under 10 people go out since November 6th. Um, I, I'm, I'm doing them, I'm doing them, just going through the employees in my head. I think it's six or seven, um, cause I, I'm going by the time I assign a computer out. <laughs> so um, okay. it, it, the numbers are, the numbers are small, but those numbers could change drastically in a day. Alder John. I appreciate Alder Dorf the, the question. I think it was a very important question to ask. Um, and and I, I'll stand behind my motion as well. I, I'm looking, you know, what we can do now moving forward. And, and this is a, a policy that's being brought to us, recognizing, you know, that there's going to be a lapse in this particular coverage for, for all staff. Um, and so, but, but we do have an opportunity here before us to say, you know what, for those that aren't covered currently, we have the ability to implement it two weeks sooner. I think let's do that. Let's move forward. And, and I think it's a good thing, a good, a, good, um, a good action to tell our police and fire that we really respect and appreciate what they do. We understand that, you know, that sometimes they're, they're in, a, in a high risk category, uh, you know, when it comes to this particular virus. And so we want to, I, I just, I'd like to make sure that they're protected as we look forward. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. Then we'll vote. All those in favor of this motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. On to informational. Consideration with possible action on the request to fill patrol officer and firefighter vacancies in 2021 that were approved 
as part of the budget. Staff? Yeah, is there any question on the, the memo that's attached to the packet? Nope. I guess Most my only question. Well, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I just have one question. Are we gonna hold these positions open because we're in the middle of a budget crisis or we're short money? Or are we gonna fill these positions as soon as is absolutely possible? I can tell you that we're gonna to try to fill them as soon as possible and I'll let Chief Smith answer that. Yes, sir. Um, our goal is to get those things filled absolutely as quick as possible. We have a couple names going to police and fire commission uh, in the next week. Uh, or a couple people being interviewed there. Um, and it is a full speed push. We're bringing in additional officers to do backgrounds. Um, and we got a couple of special assignments to do backgrounds so we can get those done as quickly as we can because we really want to get these filled. Our goal is to be right at the number. We're authorized as quickly as possible. Thank you. I appreciate that, Chief. All right, any other questions or comments? Uh, yes, uh, Director Ellen Becker. Yeah, I, just, I think I just wanna put it out there. I mean, it's been more over a year that um, I don't believe HR or finance has asked them to hold any positions. Well, and, and I understand that, uh, but sometimes uh, the department heads themselves will hold the positions open knowing that they have to make up some cost uh, shortcomings. Uh, and so, I mean, it's a, it's a double-edged sword and it's one that's always been kind of a burr for me. But anyway, I appreciate the input. I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve. You I can just do... receive and place the file. It's informational. Yeah. Okay. It says with possible action. That's why I said move to approve. But I could. What would you like, attorneys? <laughs> we don't have any attorneys. Yeah, no, sorry approve. about that. I missed well, the agenda. Joe, yeah. do, Joe, do you want to receive and place on file, or do you want to move to approve? Receive and place on file. Of possible action. Yep, that was a mistake on my part. It should not have said that. It should be uh, oh. receive and place on file. Okay, then I will change it to move to receive and place on file. Thank you. All right, I have Again. a motion, second. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes. Does anyone have any questions for item number two, report, report of routine personnel actions for regular employees? Receive and place on file. Second. All right. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, our next meeting date is January 12th at 4.30. I first, because we'll probably be, hopefully. <laughs> I'm just kidding when I say that, but uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, thank you everyone for your indulgence and your time. Take care and stay See safe. Next week. Thank you.